Blood stories in Genesis. Um, there's uh, quite a history of flood stories that have come out um, in the last uh, uh, 200, 300 years uh, since people have been digging around in uh, the Near East. Uh, the background to this slide, by the way, is the Atrahasis uh, epic, or at least a, one of the tablets. Um, there's a Sumerian a tale that's uh, commonly known as the Eridu Genesis. Uh, looks like it uh, was written, at least a conventional dating of it is uh, about 2150 BC. There are some indications that it may go back even further than that. Uh, the Akkadian, there's the Atrahasis epic, which uh, was written close to 1800 BC. And then the Epic of Gilgamesh that the copies that we have are actually the best one we have is in Ashurbanipal's library, who is the last of the great Assyrian kings. After his death, his, the empire just kind of fell apart. Um, and um, it was rapidly destroyed, actually. Uh, so that's in the 700 uh, BC range. Uh, but most of the um, most of the texts actually go back to some old Babylonian. Um, the language is in in uh, in Babylon, uh, and there was first there was Sumerian, which is an entirely different kind of language, probably closer to uh, Chinese than anything else. Um, but uh, the Akkadians, who had a definitely Semitic language, um, in the same family as Greek, er, pardon me, as, as Hebrew and Aramaic, and um, and their particular language is known as Akkadian. And uh, there's two varieties: there's Babylonian and there's uh, uh, Assyrian. Um, when you have an empire, the, the language tends to get mashed together, and actually Babylonian and Assyrian are pretty close relatives of each other, probably closer than Spanish is to Portuguese. But um, in any case, uh, there, is, there are old Babylonian epics of Gilgamesh that uh, go back to 1000 to 1300 BC, depending on uh, how you're dating it. And um, there seems to be one version that actually goes back to close to, but obviously after that of Atrahasis. Um, when it first came out, um, there were people who used it in a kind of an interesting way. This is, by the way, a quote from Andrew Dixon White, and I should have put down uh, the name of the book itself is The War. Um, it's not between Christianity and science, I, I don't think it's, a, it's theology, isn't it, in science? And theology, yeah. But um, anyway, it's a rather famous book. Um, and um, he says uh, about, I think, page 35 or so, but my, my copy is from the internet, so it's uh, a little harder to be sure of the pagination being accurate. For just at this time, the traditional view of the deluge received its death blow, and in a manner entirely unexpected, by the investigations of George Smith, among the Assyrian tablets of the British Museum in 1872, and by his discoveries just afterwards in Assyria, it was put beyond a reasonable doubt that a great mass of accounts in Genesis are simply adaptations of earlier and especially of Chaldean myths and legends. While this proved to be the fact, as regard to the account of creation and the fall of the man, it was seen to be most strikingly so, as regards the deluge. Continuing on the paragraph, the eleventh of the twelve tablets on which the most important of these inscriptions was found was almost wholly preserved, and it revealed in this legend 
dating from a time far earlier than that of Moses, such features peculiar to the childhood of the world as the building of the great ship or ark to escape the flood, the careful caulking of its seams, the saving of a man beloved of heaven, his selecting and taking with him into the vessel animals of all sorts in couples, the impressive final closing of the door, the sending forth, and I'm sure that should be of different birds as the flood abated, although this is taken straight from the internet, so it's not my typo. Um, <clears throat> the offering of sacrifice when the flood had subsided, the joy of the divine being who had caused the flood as the odor of the sacrifice reached his nostrils. Well, throughout all was shown that partiality for the Chaldean sacred number seven, which appears so constantly in the Genesis legends and throughout the Hebrew sacred scriptures. So you see, what it was used as is, oh, why are you believing that flood story? Because it's just a copy of the Chaldean flood story. So let's kind of take a look quickly at the, uh, uh, at the flood story in Gilgamesh. Uh, and this is taken from ancient Near Eastern texts. Um, uh, relating to the Old Testament, uh, rather well-known and, and uh, well-worn book in our library and everywhere else I've seen it. Uh, Gilgamesh was actually quite a character. They, nobody wanted to withstand him, but there were plenty of people who, if they thought they could get away with it, would have. He apparently was of much taller stature than average. And he was an oppressive king in Uruk. He would take uh, young men, to, uh, uh, basically draft them. Uh, and uh, he would take uh, young women, uh, uh, shall we say, on their wedding night, uh, the rite of seniority or something like that. Um, and uh, so the townspeople knew that they couldn't fight him on their own, so they decided to to uh, uh, find somebody else who could do their fighting for them. And um, the story goes that the gods created this uh, hairy fellow that was about Enkidu's height and weight. Um, and uh, so Enkidu was seduced by a temple harlot and then after he was somewhat civilized, brought to town with the express purpose of fighting Gilgamesh. Well, they did have a big fight. It ended in roughly a tie. And uh, the reaction afterwards is kind of interesting. Gilgamesh and Enkidu found themselves to be uh, uh, pals and went out and uh, drank beer together. And, um, then they set out to do a bunch of great deeds, which were fortunately away from Uruk, where, uh, so that uh, Gilgamesh's uh, Bad qualities didn't uh, overwhelm the uh, citizens anymore. And in one of their adventures, uh, Enkidu displeased the gods and died. And Gilgamesh was distraught. You know, he's a young man. He was thinking that he was immortal, and all of a sudden he realized he wasn't immortal. And he didn't want to die. And so he went in search of eternal life, and at the end of a long, perilous journey, he met the hero of the flood, Upnapishtim, who had been given eternal life by the gods. And uh, we're going to pick up the story in Tablet 11, which is the one that was mentioned earlier. Gilgamesh said to him, to Utnapishtim the far away, as I look upon thee, Utnapishtim, thy features are not strange, even as I art thou. Thou art not strange at all, even as I art thou. I, I, it sounds like Gilgamesh was expecting Udnapishtim to look wonderful like a god, and uh, it looks like me. My heart has regarded thee as resolved to do battle. That's the manly thing to do. Yet thou liest indolent upon thy back. Tell me, how joinst thou the assembly of the gods in thy quest for life? Udnapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, I will reveal to thee, that's my typo, 
Gilgamesh, a hidden matter and a secret of the gods I will tell thee. Uh, Shurapak, a city which thou knowest, it's on the Euphrates. The city was ancient, as were the gods within it. When their hearts led the great gods to produce the flood, and there's the list of some of the gods there. Nininu Ia was also present with them. Their words he repeats to the reed hut. A little bit of background here. Ia had been sworn, according to other stories, not to tell the people. But see, if he's talked to the hut and somebody happened to overhear, that was not breaking his promise. So he says, reed hut, reed hut, wall, wall, reed hut, hearken, wall, reflect. Man of Shurapak, son of Ubartutu, tear down this house, build a ship, give up possessions, seek thou life, forswear worldly goods, and keep the soul alive. Aboard the ship take thou the seed of all living things. The ship that thou shalt build, her dimensions shall be to measure. Equal shall be her width and her length. Like the Apsu thou shalt seal her. I understood and I said to Ea, my lord, behold, my lord, what thou hast thus ordered, I will be honored to carry out. But what shall I answer the city, the people and the elders? He opened his mouth to speak, saying to me, his servant, thou shalt thus uh, then thus speak to them, I have learned that en Enlil is hostile to me so that I cannot reside in your city. Now set my foot in Enlil's territory. To the deep I will therefore go down to dwell with my Lord Ea. But upon you he will shower down abundance, the choicest birds, the rarest fishes. The land shall have its fill of harvest riches. He who at dusk orders the husk greens will shower down upon you a rain of wheat. There's apparently some Akkadian words that can mean either um, either lots of wheat or lots of uh, rain, and so it's, there, there's a little bit of play on words here. Um, with the first glow of dawn, the land was gathered about me, and then they can't read the next part. Uh, you can see why if you look at the uh, condition of some of the other uh, uh, tablets. The little ones uh, carried by two men, while the grown ones brought all else that was needful. On the fifth day I laid her framework, one whole anchor was her floor space, ten dozen cubits the height of each of her walls, ten dozen cubits each edge of the square deck. So we're building basically a big cubic box. I laid out the contours and joined her together. I provided her with six decks, dividing her thus into seven parts. So you have the floor and then you have deck one, two, three, four, five, six. Her floor plan I divided into nine parts. Um, I, don't, I guess that's thirds each way, I'm not sure. Um, I hammered water plugs into her, I saw to the punting poles. Punting poles are what you would take and uh, move a raft with by putting it all the way down into the floor of the lake bed or whatever you're trying to get across. Um, it's interesting little detail there. Laid in supplies, six sar measures of bitumen I poured into the furnace and they figure that that's approximately 48 thousand gallons. Uh, three sar of asphalt I also poured inside. Three sar of oil the basket bearers carried aside from the one sar of oil which the caulking consumed and the two sar of oil which the boatmen stowed away. I don't know, to eat maybe? Um, bullocks I slaughtered for the people and sheep I killed and I killed sheep every day. Meat, red wine, oil and white wine. I gave the workmen to drink as though river water. So he's got quite an entourage that he has to feed. That they might feast is on New Year's Day. I opened ointment, applying it to my hand. On the seventh day, the ship was completed. Pretty fast uh, building of a ship of that size. 
The launching was very difficult so that they had to shift the floor planks above and below until two-thirds of the structure had gone into the water. I assume that that, that means that it, re re it rested with uh, uh, only about a third of the ship sticking out. Whatever I had, I laid it upon her. Whatever I had of silver, I laid it upon her. Whatever I had of gold, I laid it, laid it upon her. Whatever I've had of all living beings, I laid it upon her. All my family and kins I made go aboard the ship. The beasts of the field, the wild creatures of the field, all the craftsmen I made go aboard. He's getting everybody in. Shamash had set for me a stated time. When he who orders unease at night will shower down a rain of blight, board thou the ship and batten up the entrance. The stated time had arrived. He who orders an ease at night showers down a rain of blight. I watched the appearance of the weather. The weather was awesome to behold. I boarded down the whole ship to Puzer Amuri, the boatman. I ha handed over the structure together with its contents. Um, so he apparently has a, a captain on this ship. With the first glow of dawn, a black cloud rose up from the horizon. Inside it, Adad thunders, while Shalat and Hanish go in front. Uh, Adad is the standard. Hadad is sometimes known, and Ben Hadad is the son of the god of storms. Um, uh, Shalat and Hanish are people that are gods that we don't really know very much about except that they apparently herald storms. Uh, moving as heralds over the hill and plain, Erigal tears out the posts. Um, forth comes Ninurta and causes the dikes to follow. The Anukai lift up the torches, setting the land ablaze with their glare. This is kind of an interesting passage. I'm not sure how you fit that into a flood, but um, consternation over Adad reaches to the heavens, who turned to blackness all that had been light. That's again my typo. The wide land was shattered like a pot. For one day, the south storm blew, gathering speed as it blew, submerging the mountains, overtaking the people like a battle. No one can see his fellow, nor can people be recognized from heaven. The gods were frightened by the deluge. And shrinking back, they ascended to the heaven of Anu. The gods cowered like dogs, crouched against the outer wall. Ishtar cried out like a woman in travail. The sweet-voiced mistress of the gods moans aloud. The olden days, are, alas, are turned to clay, because I bespoke evil in the assembly of the gods. How could I bespeak evil in the assembly of the gods, ordering battle in the dis for the destruction of my people? When it is I myself who gave birth to my people, like to the spawn of the fishes, they fill the sea. The Anakai gods weep with her. The Anakai are the top gods. The Igigi apparently are the lower class gods. We'll see them later. Um, the gods all humbled sit and weep, their lips drawn tight. One and all, six days and six nights blows the flood wind as the south storm sweeps the land. When the seventh day arrived, the flood carrying south storm subsided in the battle which had, had fought like an army. The sea grew quiet, the tempest was still, the flood ceased. I looked at the weather, stillness had set in and all of, all of mankind had returned to clay. The landscape was as level as a flat roof. I opened a hatch and light fell upon my face. Bowing low, I sat and wept, tears running down my face. I looked about for coastlines in the expanse of the sea. That's my spelling. In each of 14 regions, there emerged a region mountain. On Mount Nisser, the ship came to a halt. Mount Nisser held the ship fast, allowing no motion. One day, a second day, Mount Nisser held the ship fast, allowing no motion. A third day, fourth day, Mount Nisser held the ship fast, allowing no motion. A fifth day, sixth day, Mount Nisser held the ship fast, allowing no motion. When the seventh day arrived, I went forth and set free a dove. The dove went forth but came back, since no resting place for it was visible. She turned around. Then I sent forth and set free a swallow. The swallow went forth but came back, since no resting place for it was visible. She turned around. Then I 
sent forth and set free a raven. The raven went forth. And seeing that the waters had diminished, he eats, circles, caws, and turns not around. Meaning, I think, turns not back to the ship. Then I let out all to the four winds and offered a sacrifice. I poured out a libation on top of the mountain. Seven and seven cult vessels I set up. Upon their pot stands I heat cane, cedar wood, and myrtle. The gods smelled the savor. It's interesting that the savor seems to be as much about the cane, cedar wood, and myrtle as the sacrifices, but the gods smelled the sweet savor. The gods crowded it like flies about the sacrificer. When at last the great goddess arrived, she lifted up the great jewels which Anu had fashioned to her liking. Ye gods here, as surely as this lapis upon my neck, I shall not forget. I shall be mindful of these days, forgetting them never. Let the gods come to the offering, but let not Enlil come to the offering, for he, unreasoning, brought on the deluge, and my people consigned to destruction. When at last, at length, Enlil, as Enlil arrived and saw the ship, Enlil was wroth. He was filled with wrath over the Igigi gods. Has some living skull escaped? No man was to survive the destruction. And there to open his mouth to speak, saying to valiant Enlil, who other than Ea can devise plans? It is Ea alone who knows every matter. Ea opened his mouth to speak, saying to valiant Enlil, thou wisest of gods, thou hero, how couldst thou unreasoning bring on the deluge? On the sinner imposes sin, on the transgressor imposes transgression, yet be lenient, lest he be cut off. Be patient, lest he be dislodged. Instead of bringing on the deluge, would that a lion had risen up to diminish mankind. Instead of bringing on the deluge, would that a wolf had risen up to diminish mankind. Instead of bringing on the deluge, would that a famine had risen up to lay low mankind. Instead of bringing on the deluge, would that a pestilence had risen up to smite down mankind. It was not I who disclosed the secret of the great gods. I let Atrahasis see a dream, and he perceived the secret of the gods. I didn't actually tell him, he just figured it out. Well, maybe with a little help. Now then, take counsel in regards to him. Thereupon Enlil went on board the, aboard the ship, holding me by the hand. This is, of course, Utnapishtim talking. He took me aboard, he took my wife aboard, and made her kneel by my side. Standing between us, he touched our foreheads to bless us. Hitherto Utnapishtim has been human. Henceforth, Utnapishtim and his wife shall be like unto us gods. Utnapishtim shall reside far away at the mouth of the rivers. Thus they took me and made me reside far away at the mouth of the rivers. But now, who will for thy sake call the gods to assembly, that the life which thou seekest thou mayest find? Up, lie down, lie not down to sleep for six days and seven nights. That last is a little challenge to Gilgamesh. See if you can stay awake for seven days in a row. And uh, as the story keeps going, Gilgamesh can't resist sleep and it's proven to him that he can't resist sleep, so he's not worthy of eternal life. And uh, so Utnapishtim washes Gilgamesh clean and then gives him a new cloak. And then just before he leaves, in fact, Gil uh, Utnapishtim has kind of sent him on his way. And Utnapishtim's wife says, hey, um, aren't you going to give him a parting gift? And he says, oh, yeah, well, I'll tell him about this plant at the bottom of the water that can give eternal life. So Gilgamesh hears about it and immediately ties some stones onto his feet and jumps into the water. He finds the plant and then he cuts the stones loose from his feet and surfaces and uh, he sets the pla plant down to bathe uh, actually sometime shortly thereafter but not, uh, not immediately but not too long. And uh, he goes down I think into a well and uh, some serpent comes out and grabs the plant and eats it and then uh, leaves its skin behind because now it has eternal life. And uh, Gilgamesh doesn't and he's 
crestfallen over this, but he goes back to Uruk and uh, shows the boatman that took him over to see Noah the city, and that's where the story ends. Um, as people have discovered more things, it, uh, another tale has come up, that of Atrahasis. Um, and there's a couple of places that you can find that. The ancient Near Eastern text has it. Um, the, um, a much more complete version, although interestingly, they don't always match exactly, and we're going to see some of that. Uh, it can be found in uh, Lambert and Millard in 1969. Um, uh, we're just going to go over the part of the, that has to do with the flood itself and uh, maybe a little bit of the run-up to it. The land became wide, the people became numerous, the land bellowed like wild oxen. The god was disturbed by their uproar. Enlil heard their clamor and said to the great gods, oppressive has become the clamor of mankind. By their uproar, they present, prevent sleep. So instead of God looking over and saying, uh, they just do evil continually, uh, the noise is bothering me. And Lil, uh, this is a summary little thing here. And Lil made a drought, which mankind survived. Um, the uh, people resort to cannibalism after six years of famine. Uh, there's uh, also uh, less than 1,200 years after that happened, there was another uh, time when people grow numerous enough to make too much noise for Enlil, and so he sent a pestilence. And then less than 1,200 years after that, we're going to pick up with uh, Tremhasis, and apparently it's spelled different ways in, in different uh, languages. What it actually means is exceedingly wise. Um, I sort of joke that it might be super smart. Um, Atrahasis opens his mouth, opened his mouth saying to his lord, this is he's talking to Ea, uh, make me known unto me its content that I may seek its, and this is fragmentary so they're having a hard time supplying what should be there. Ea opened his mouth, saying to his servant, Thou sayest, let me seek, whatever, the task which I'm about to tell thee, guard thou well. Well, hearken to me. And this now starts to sound very much like uh, in the Pishtim uh, listening. Read hut, guard all my words, destroy the house, build the ship, renounce worldly goods, keep the soul alive, the ship that thou shalt build, and then we lose the, uh, something in the cracks there. And then it goes on, build a large ship of good, something or other shall be its structure. That ship shall be an ark, and its name shall be Preserver of Life. Seal it with a mighty cover into the ship which thou shalt make. Thou shalt take the beasts of the field, the fowls of heaven, and then they can't read anymore for some time. And then uh, here we're starting to get little pieces of it in, like the vault of, star above, and below, cock. At the state of time in which I will inform thee, enter the ship and close the door of the ship. Aboard her bring thy grain, thy possessions, thy goods, thy wife, thy family, thy relations, and the craftsmen. Beasts of the field, creatures of the field, as many as eat herbs, I will send to thee, and they shall guard thy door. Atrahasis opened his mouth to speak, saying to Ea, his lord, I have never built a ship. Draw a design of it on the ground. I need a blueprint. That seeing the design, I may build the ship. Draw on the ground what thou hast commanded. Um, again, we're starting to lose pieces of lines. Atrahasis received the command. He assembled the elders to his gate. Atrahasis opened his mouth. Now here, he hasn't been told what to say, at least uh, that we know of, but it may be in the break there somewhere. But here he's going to talk to the elders. My God does not agree with your God. Enki and Enlil are angry with one another. They have expelled me from my house, I guess, since I reverence Enki. 
Uh, interestingly, uh, Ea has now merged into Enki. He told me of this matter. I cannot live in your land, maybe. Uh, I cannot set my feet on the earth of Enlil. With the gods, and now we're starting to get, I guess what you could call phone static. This is what he told me. And then picking up when you can start reading it again. He sent his family on board. They ate, they drank, but he was in and out. He could not sit, could not crouch, for his heart was broken. And he was vomiting gall, really upset. The appearance of the weather changed. Adad roared in on the, uh, in the clouds. And that's where we kind of lose it. Then we have Enuma Elish, the Babylonian Genesis. And again, you can get that at uh, a number of different sources. Um, ancient Near Eastern text has it as well, but there are some other. Uh, Enuma Elish begins with, when above the heaven had not yet been named. And Enumish, uh, Enuma Elish means when on high. So basically, they named it after the first couple of words of the, uh, of the uh, text. When in the uh, Apsu primeval, their begetter existed in Mother Tiamat, who gave birth to them all, when their waters still mingled together in no dry land. Um, another translation says Reed Hut, and I'm not sure which one is the better uh, translation. Unfortunately, my knowledge of Akkadian is very limited. Um, had been formed, and not even a marsh could be seen. And the main gods begot some other gods. Apsu wanted to kill the other gods, but Tiamat protested. Then Ea put Apsu to sleep and killed him. Um, uh, Tiamat was Apsu's wife. Um, Ea then begat Mar Mar Marduk, Tiamat with a new consort, Kingu who took Apsu's place, I guess, now fought against the younger gods. And uh, Ea, Anu, and Anshar could not withstand her. And so Marduk says, well, I'll take the job, but you have to pay me by allowing me to be the supreme ruler. So Marduk used some strong winds to fight against Tiamat and her monsters. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of monsters. He killed her with an arrow. He split her like a self shellfish into two parts. Half of her he set up and sealed as it as a sky, pulled down the bar and posted guards. He bade them to allow not her waters to escape. Tiamat's salt water. Marduk then causes the moon to shine and creates savage man from clay and the blood of Kingu. Now, in the other ones, actually, if you go back far enough, you'll find out that, uh, that Marduk, um, or pardon me, that, uh, that th uh, man was made from the blood of a god that had personality. Meaning, I guess the other ones didn't, I'm not sure. Um, uh, to be charged with the service of the gods that they might be at ease. So the reason mankind was made was so that the gods could relax and the men could do all the work. The names of Marduk are then recited and praised. There's not really much in there on the flood itself. It's only, um, it's only really a creation story. Um, there is another fragment that I found in, the, in the, uh, found in ancient Near Eastern texts um, which, uh, uh, which talks about a deluge as well, and it's apparently the oldest one. Mankind will apparently create temples for the gods, and then uh, I'm going to join into the actual reading of the, of the thing itself. After Anu, Enlil, Enki, and Nir Nir Ninhursag had fashioned the black-headed people, um, Vegetation luxuriated from the earth. Animals, four-legged creatures of the plains were brought artfully into existence. And then we lose it for 37 lines. Um, 
Then did Zisudra the king, the Pasusu, which is apparently a uh, temple priest of some kind. And I think that's actually Pashishu. Uh, they have a little check over the S. Built giant, something humbly, obediently, reverently, he attending daily constantly, bringing forth all kinds of dreams, uttering the name of heaven, earth. And then there's something about gods and a wall, and then Zisustra standing at its side. So it sounds like there's, here's another wall thing. Listen, stand by the wall at my left side. By the, by the wall I will say a word to thee. Take my word, give ear to my instruction. By our council maybe, a flood will sleep, sweep over the cult centers to destroy the seed of mankind. Is the decision, the word of the assembly of the gods. By the word commanded by Anu and Enlil, it's kingship. Interesting, I guess the flood happened before Anu was killed or something. I'm not sure. Um, I wonder if they, they even really cared about trying to put those pieces together. But its kingship, its rule, will be put to an end. And then we lose the story again. All the windstorms exceedingly powerful attacked as one. At the same time, the flood sweeps over the cult centers. <coughs> and for seven days and seven nights, the flood had swept over the land, and the huge boat had been tossed about by the windstorms on the great waters. Utu, that's the sun god in this particular uh, version. Uh, this is uh, Sumerian, and so Shamash would have been the sun god in Akkadian. Um, came forth, who sheds light on heaven and earth. Zisudra opened a window of the huge boat. There's a window in this boat, apparently. Uh, the hero Utu brought his rays into the giant boat. Zisudra, the king, prostrated himself before Utu. The king kills an ox, slaughters a sheep. Um, one of the translations is oxen and sheep, and again, I don't know enough to be able to judge between the two. And then we lose it again. And then it comes back to, you will utter breath of heaven, breath of earth. Verily, it will stretch itself by your... Enu and Enlil will utter the breath of heaven, breath of earth by their... And unfortunately, we lost it. Otherwise, we could have put it into the other one. Um, it stretched itself. Vegetation coming up out of the earth rises up. Zisudra the king prostrated himself before Enu and Enlil. Enu and Enlil cherish Zisudra. Breath eternal like that of a god they bring down for him. And then we get a break. Now, that's a lot of stuff to look at. The reason that I'm having you look at it is because of a, uh, a, a paper by John Morris, uh, which is put out in Acts and Facts. And uh, it's citing a, an older document, uh, uh, Expository Times. And basically he's saying that for a long time the standard view among higher critics had been that the Genesis flood account was written long after Moses by a Jewish priest. And uh, um, they figured that the Gilgamesh story couldn't have been earlier than 1800 BC. Abraham lived during the 2100s. Um, Thus, none of the Babylonian writings existed until long after the flood, and that's, well, probably true. Gilgamesh epic is likely a corruption of an older document. Well, I think we can see pretty clearly that it's certainly borrowed from the Atrahasis epic. And uh, he argues that, uh, that you wouldn't have a cubicle arc. It wouldn't have been seaworthy. And... Uh, he thinks that the gods gathered like flies to receive sacrifices is ridiculous, although I'm not sure I would make that case uh, for the uh, Babylonians. If it was that ridiculous, I don't think that they would, uh, that, that they would have put it into their uh, story, at least to them. 
The similarities, similarities between the epic and Genesis are striking, but the differences are overwhelming. And uh, then uh, he says there's another even earlier flood tablet, and he gives the translation, and they've omitted, he's omitted all of the brackets and stuff, so you don't know which stuff is actually original and which is not. Um, and we're going to go back to the original and, and uh, with the brackets in. And his argument is that this particular passage is actually pretty close to the Genesis account. And so Genesis appears to be further back rather than something that came out of, let's say, the exile. And there are actually two different translations of the exact same passage. And I, I'm going to let them, I'm going to put them up in parallel so you can see how people work with this kind of thing. Um, will I loosen or will I open? And uh, you can put whatever you want to in the, in, the, uh, in the brackets because that's obviously stuff that they're having to supply. And uh, here they supply virtually the same thing. Uh, it will sweep away all men together. It will affect man, all mankind at once. Uh, effect is a little more gentle than sweep away, but uh, um, but seek thy life before the deluge cometh forth, before the flood breaks forth. As many as there are, however many they are, I will bring overthrow, destruction, annihilation. <laughs> annihilation, destruction, ruin, obviously three terms that mean pretty close to the same thing. And then there's build a great ship and a total height shall be its structure. And uh, the one supposes that there was cubits in there at one time because that was the standard measurement. But obviously you can't actually read that. A houseboat it shall be containing those who preserve their life with a strong roof or a strong deck cover it. The ship which thou shalt make, into it bring the beasts of the field, animals of the field, the birds of the air, and the creeping things of the reptiles that's supplied. And interesting, they're supplying two of each or two of everything, um, both of them, in, instead of a number, instead of their whole number, whatever that is. And then this is where you kind of lose it. Well, it is pretty close. There isn't anything in that particular passage that really contradicts the Genesis account. Um, but there's something odd about it, and, and you may have noticed that. Now, here's the really weird part. Uh, in Atrahasis, just before this, you have destroy the house, build the ship, renounce worldly goods, keep the soul alive, the ship that thou shalt build. Well, the only place that really fits um, really there's not any parallels at all. Uh, although there is a break here. But here, it gets really strange. Build a large ship. Build a huge ship of good something shall be its structure, be its complete height. That ship shall be an ark in its name, shall be preserver of life. A houseboat hall it shall be containing those who preserve their life. Um, with a mighty cover, with a strong roofing cover. What's strange is not just the parallels of what's there, but the parallels in the breaks. And if you go further, it continues to do this. Thou shalt make, thou makest the beast of the field, the fowls of the heavens, and interestingly enough, and then all of a sudden, <coughs> instead of their whole number is simply gone. And the family of the is simply gone <coughs> into whatever break this is. 
I'm not sure what's going on there. The first part really doesn't match well, but then you could say, well, that's in a lacuna. Then you have this part that looks like it's the same tablet. And then you have, at the end, it doesn't end at exactly the same point. Um, was it fashionable to break these things into pieces just at that point? Maybe both were copying a uh, tablet that had a break as well. And one of them was uh, carried it through and the other one didn't. Uh, it's, just, it's just bizarre. Um, now, if you look at... Um, there are other copies of Atrahasis, and some of them are a little more complete. And so I looked at one of those, and uh, uh, well, here's a roof. The tackle shall be very strong. Let the pitch be tough. Nothing about pitch or tackle here. Um, I mean, you have the roof, but that's about it. And, and then there's a bunch of other stuff there. Um, I will rain down upon you here an abundance of birds, a profusion of fishes, um, the animals, the birds of the air. I don't know, fishes? Um, I really have a hard time making that a good parallel. And so you have, you have a strange feature where Atrahasis apparently has two different recensions, one of which is very close to this uh, piece and, and one of which is not. Now, if you do try to do a comparison, Ia speaks to a reed hut. Ia speaks to a reed hut in the Deluge one, Zasudra. This is the earliest one from Sumer. Um, Zasudra listens to a wall. Now, God does speak to Noah, but there's no evidence that he kind of hid it. I don't know. Um, Utnapishtim is told to fool his countrymen. Atarhasis is told to fool his countrymen. The Sudra we don't have it, although there's a big break, so who knows. Uh, if you read the text, it doesn't actually say that Noah preaches. Now, if you go later in the Bible, it does talk about Noah preach a preacher of righteousness in his generation. And uh, so, you know, you could say, well, it was implied, I guess. Um, but it certainly it's not stated in the text. Um, in Gilgamesh, the ship is a cube of 1,200 cubits. In Genesis, the ark is 300 by 50 by 30, which is a lot more sensible for a boat. Um, in Atrahasis, in the Deluge, it's not mentioned. Uh, the ark has a roof. The, the ship is referred to as an ark in Atrahasis. Um, the ship took seven days to build. The ship is, took 120 years to build. In Gilgamesh, punting poles are used. Um, the ship was made of bitumen with, with pitch, yes. God, Utnapishtim put the animals on board. Atrahasis put the animals on board, but God sent the animals to Noah. The storm lasted seven days. In Genesis, the storm lasted 40 days. The waters increased for, well, depending on how you count it, uh, they were certainly around for a year, but they got up for 150 uh, days at least. Um, then they, in Gilgamesh, a dove and a swallow and a raven are sent. In Genesis, it's a raven, dove, dove, dove. Um, in Atrahasis and the Deluge are not mentioned, although maybe if we had the complete recension, we'd find it. At the end, Utnapishtim offers a sacrifice. At the end, Atrahasis probably offered a sacrifice because the god smelled the sacrifice, so presumably he did. Uh, Zisudra prostrates himself. He doesn't actually offer a sacrifice. Noah does offer a sacrifice. The god smelled the sacrifice. God did smell the sacrifice. In Genesis, in, in the Deluge, it's not mentioned. And again, a lot of stuff can get lost in the... Uh, in the uh, uh, lacunae. 
My own personal take on that is that there's, there's a little more match between the earlier stories in Genesis than with the Gilgamesh story in Genesis because of the differences, not so much because of the, the, uh, um, the fragment does match quite well, but it's very short. And I guess you could argue that the origin of Genesis is probably earlier than that of Gilgamesh, uh, which would, of course, put it at 1800 BC, and that's not the standard uh, theory, um, because it does match the other ones a little bit better, but um, uh, it's not the kind of argument that I would stand a lot of, uh, uh, I would make a, a big deal of, in fact, either way, because when you're trying to match things and half of the puzzle pieces are missing, um, it makes it a lot harder. Now, I think that it would be interesting to see what happens if we get more puzzle pieces and see whether, in fact, uh, there's more matching. I'd love to have a complete version of Atrahasis and see whether, um, see whether there's any birds released and if so, what kinds. Uh, I think that would be fascinating. Um, but I'm not sure that you can do too much with any of this. I'm, I guess I would say that uh, on balance uh, that uh, John Morris has a point. Uh, it's probably a minor point and not one that can be pressed very hard. And with that, I will throw this open for discussion. Pass that back. In your comparison uh, blocks there, the tables at the end, you didn't have the fragment. Is that because it's so small that? The, there's not very much. I mean, it's, you got the beast in. The, uh, uh, in. Uh, and that was the problem that I had with using it in a way that says, well, this is actually the original, is because it is so small that there's, there's just not much there. And it is this fragment that John Morris is using to make his point that Genesis is probably a lot earlier than... But if it, Genesis is this early, <coughs> it would have to have been um, maintained by Abraham or Abraham's... Um, immediate um, ancestors. I, I'm not quite sure what, where, where does, where does Morris take this, other than to say that maybe Genesis is, is based upon um, earlier fragments than the ones that we've we've traditionally looked at. I think if you were to ask Morris, he doesn't clearly uh, m mention that. Um, but I think if you were to ask him and push him on that point, what he would say is that Genesis was preserved by God the way it was supposed to be, and so that uh, uh, so that even if it was written by Moses, it would still be um, uh, it would still be more accurate than uh, than the and the, and the longer you wait, the more corruptions creep into the story. I think that that would be the way he would argue. Well, that, w that would require, because Hebrew was, certainly wasn't around in 1800, as far as we can tell. So it, it would have to have been written in some... Um, well, that's not actually true. Hebrew was around in 1800? Uh, Hebrew came out... Uh, the first written Hebrew we have is the 19th century, uh, by conventional dating. It's found in the Sinai. Um, there are some very short inscriptions. And uh, uh, if you check with Bill Shea, he can, t he can tell you which ones they are because that's kind of his area. The Proto-Sinaitic inscriptions are yes. you referring to? I thought they were much later, 1400 or... No, they're actually, uh, they're actually conventional date is 1900. Um, the, um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is that if you read these things, after a while you start seeing some patterns. And for example, there's a place where um, it says Atrahasis did so and so at the end of one of the tablets. And then at the beginning it starts out Atrahasis did so and so, and it's a verbal repeat. As if this is 
you know, the, the scribe is deliberately helping to connect the tablets. And it's, it happens more than once. I mean, it's, it's a standard thing. Um, and uh, one of the things that they don't always translate, uh, some, some people do and some people don't, is that at the end it will often say, done by scribe so-and-so in so-and-so's reign kind of thing. Um, so that you'll get, you'll get that kind of a picture. And one of the odd things about Genesis is that if you'll notice that Genesis t uh, 2, 4 has um, a kind of colophon that matches the beginning, and then immediately after, there's another one that is phrased almost identically. Which is quite likely the start of the next. And, and one of the proposals that has been made uh, by P.E. Weissman in particular was that in fact it was originally tablets. And that that is the first tablet and then that is and uh, the, the word Toledoth is actually having to, st this is the story of the heavens and the earth. This is the story of Abraham. And most people connected with the, the genealogy afterwards. Um, actually, there is no a story of Abraham. Interestingly enough, there's a story of Adam. Um, there's a story of the three sons of Noah. Um, there's, and, and and interestingly, that is the one place where you have the uh, duplicate and, in some cases, triplicate uh, stories. Um, maybe there were three stories that were, in fact, fused into one. This, this is slightly off the topic, but um, if these tablets, the tablets were originally um, incised with a stylus, uh, and they were clay, and they were sun-dried, uh, the ones that we have are mostly ones that have been baked in a fire, the palace. Were some of the tablets originally baked before they were put in the library, or were they all sun-dried? Or do we know? I don't know. I do know specifically that the one that was referred to by Morris was, in fact, not sun-dried. I, I mean, it was not baked. It was sun-dried. It was sun-dried. Because I know that most of the ones that have survived through the years are ones that have been baked I, in, a, in, a, in a fire that consumed the, the libraries, but yeah, I was wondering it was, if... It was the nicest way of preserving the libraries they could do. <laughs> well, they've lasted a lot longer than our digital storage media is likely to last. <laughs> uh, I find the argument very interesting that if you... Uh, find several different sources uh, talking about a similar, how should I say, recounting of something, uh, that that event presumably being recounted is now less legitimate and more mythical instead of being more legitimate and less mythical, uh, which is a, a strange way of reconstructing history. Um, not so long ago, I was listening to a radio program while driving somewhere where a scholar was uh, speaking on the subject, where did Ulysses go during uh, Ulysses' many travels and uh, essentially traced the travels all the way around UK and in the Scandinavian territory until he had a chance to return back home which was an interesting discussion. But there is an example of where a scholar took what everybody else would literally consider a literature or a myth and tried to reconstruct the actual path from it, just given whatever information he was able to glean from it. And he was able to get some geographical um, highlights, how should I point, and, and get some markers along the way and, and glean certain ideas. Whereas when it comes to flood, it seems that no matter how many recountings we encounter 
from different cultures and the like, the only conclusions that everybody seems to like to tend towards is that that, that only makes the myth deeper instead of somehow mm, uh, just an example of more people trying to remember something that happened long ago. Well, you're, you're right uh, that uh, one of the things you have to remember, I think, is that worldview fits into it extremely well. Uh, if you know that there wasn't a flood that covered, for practical purposes, all the world, then these are automatically myth stories. And then each myth story is further evidence that you can't believe it. If you are willing to listen to the ancient world with the possibility that they may be right on the major points, then the more of these you hear, the more of a testimony it is that something actually happened. Um, and that you, then you might try to figure out what's going on. Um, you mentioned Ulysses, and it's interesting that you did that because, of course, Ulysses came from, if I remember correctly, Troy. And for a long time there was a big dispute over whether this mm -hmm. was just a myth of the Greeks. And then um, a German uh, archaeologist whose name I forget, Schliemann, Schliemann went over to Troy and uh, found out that there was an actual city there. <coughs> now, there, there's still a problem in that the Troy that existed when they think this was written is a relatively small city and it's hard to see how it would actually fit the story completely. Of interest is there's another Troy that's further down in the archaeological record and therefore older that actually would fit it much better. Um, and that raises some interesting questions as to whether uh, Greek archaeology is uh, accurate and if Greek archaeology is tied to Egypt then it raises interesting questions about whether Egyptian archaeology has its chronology straight. But at least I think everybody pretty well concedes that there was in fact a Troy. Whether this was an exaggerated story or whether this was a story that actually fits a big city, I guess we'll have to leave to uh, further debate. But at least we, we have that much that we know about. Ariel. It seems to me that uh one, one factor that's especially significant here is the fact that these flood stories are so much more common than other world calamities. You look in Steve Thompson's Index of Folk Literature and the flood is six times as common as any other, of which there are several, uh, causes of world calamities in the past. And uh, this tends to make you think, well, maybe these stories were based on a real event. Uh, when you come to the fact that, well, maybe the oldest one is the most accurate because it's closest to the thing. Uh, uh, well, you can argue that, I think, fairly, uh, unless you allow for inspiration. And then the whole picture changes. Uh, and once you uh, allow for God, you can't allow for inspiration, and I think that uh, makes the Genesis account credible. 